welcome to Kelly and Wrighty. Darren Bent is in for Wrighty today. Forget the Oscars. The Premier League is where all the drama is at. Just one point between the top three. Is this the best title race ever? Are Arsenal top? If it stays like this, then yes, it is. Arsenal do finish the match week top of the table after Liverpool and Manchester City stalemate. Klopp and Pep's last dance, but which manager will be happier going into the last ten games? There is so much to dissect. Arsenal's next league game is at City. That could be huge, but is Kai Havertz becoming the Gunners' most important player after his late winner against Brentford? We need a striker anyway. Of course, who predicted a 4-0 away win in the Darren Bent derby, <laughs> also known as Villa against Tottenham. Big Ange says Spurs fans should be getting excited about the top four running, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what a game that was at Anfield, though. Can we relive it? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and Guardiola have gone head to head in the past it has sometimes been beautiful to behold it has sometimes been chaos it has never been anything short of compelling it is a game that could shape the course of the Premier League title race 10 games to go after this one Stones at the front post has been Just off target. Jeremy Doku! Post! And it's another draw between Liverpool and Manchester City. It was, uh, I think, a good game for um, spectators. We take that point. Today, we showed we are ready to fight as long as the race goes. I'm gonna take it all. Well, anyone watching on, maybe not those directly involved, will be hoping that this race does continue right to the end of the season. That draw between Liverpool and Manchester City leaves the Premier League title race poised for a thrilling final ten matches. Arsenal top on goal difference after their win against Brentford. And then there's just a point between the top three. The race for the top four is heating up as well. Tottenham are now just two points behind Aston Villa, but they do have a game in hand. Manchester United's win over Everton keeps them eight points off fourth spot, but they're only six points off Tottenham, and it might well go to fifth, as we keep saying. At the bottom of the table, all three of the sides in the relegation places drew this weekend, so that means they are at least a point closer to safety because Nottingham Forest defeat at Brighton means they are just three points above the drop zone, and they've played 28 games, which is a game more than Luton. Everton haven't won any of their last 11 Premier League games and they are just four points above the bottom three. They played 28 as well. So the race at the bottom is starting to look a bit closer than we expected, but that race at the top is going to be so exciting as we head into the final stages of the season. Owen Hargreaves is here. Flo Lloyd Hughes is here as well. Darren, what a weekend. What have we learned overall from Arsenal's win over Brentford mm -hmm. and Liverpool's draw with Manchester City. That looks like it's in a gold way to the wire. Um, I'm sure we'll probably look at the, the running between now and the end of the show, but I mean, that game at Anfield yesterday was incredible. Liverpool, probably looking back, should have won it with the chances they had. Obviously, a bit of a decision at the end of the game, which I'm sure you're not happy about. <laughs> but if you're an Arsenal fan, I mean, you've got to keep believing. You have to keep believing because we saw last season it get to this kind of stage and then fall off a cliff and they had injuries, but this season their players are coming back. They're winning games. They found a way to beat Brentford. Uh, at the weekend as well, when it was it was poised to be a draw. This is so much to look forward to. But as I said, it looks like, to me, it's going to go right to the wire. Yeah, a few wobbly moments in that game yeah. for, for Arsenal, which we will look at in, in due course. But the game between Liverpool and Manchester City seems like it's reset this title race because City on top in the first half, Liverpool right back in it, making City look quite shaky in the, in the second half. And suddenly it just looks like possibilities have opened up in either direction. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Dan nailed it. I think it's a, 
it's a three-horse title race, and, and thankfully, I think it's great for the league. Arsenal are legitimate, they showed it. But to be fair, Anfield does that to you uh, as a stadium. When you go there as a uh, opposition team, remember with Manchester United, it's hard. It's, it's the hardest place to so go and play. Opposition fans hate this chat. Yeah. They really don't <laughs> like it. So, so tell me why it's a real thing for a, for a player. I think the pitch is a little bit smaller, probably, than, than, say, the Emirates, so it's a little bit tighter, so you have less time on the ball, the crowd is a little bit more intense. Now, all of a sudden, that Man, Man United-Liverpool rivalry, it almost feels like that is now transition because Man United are struggling. Anfield is just the hardest stadium. I don't know why. I don't know if it's the history, uh, the energy, Dan. We, we, you've been there as a player. It's, and actually, Pep wanted to make a point after the game. Yes, he has just as hard, by the way. Liverpool haven't gone there and won, so... Uh, Anfield can do that to even the best teams. We've seen Manchester City went there, I think, in the Champions League and had a little wall. Do you remember for about yeah. 20 minutes where they were just on the ropes? And I think that can happen. Uh, but I'm amazed at how, how good this Liverpool t team is, even with you know, some youngsters in the side. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Manchester City. And, and I thought they were fantastic. And I'm sure Klopp believes they can go win the Premier League, which I don't think he would have thought at the beginning of the season. The, the question mark over Liverpool's injuries and the players who've come in to, to replace them is the one that's been hanging over Liverpool in terms of their, their title challenge. With Manchester City, again, the sort of history would tell you that they are so strong at this stage of the season and they, they have the title in their, their sights when we get to this point. Did yesterday's game do anything to, to change those sort of previous con preconceptions? I think so. I think so. And especially that period where Man City were really on the ropes, especially in the last sort of 20 minutes or so, because there was a period, I think, at the start of the first half where Manchester City had a grip on the game and we've seen them in moments get off to a good start and then just take total and utter control. But Liverpool didn't let that phase them. And I think the belief feels different here, even in tough moments. Liverpool know that they're probably going to find a way, even if they leave it late on, and maybe there's a little bit of luck involved at times. If you can dig deep and do that, that carries you through, no matter who you have in your squad or the injury issues. I think that counts for a lot. And to know that they can, like Owen said, match everyone pretty much, apart from, I think, that game at the Emirates against Arsenal, where I think that was one of their poorest performances of the entire season. I do think they just feel so confident. And I think the atmosphere at Anfield also feels different. I think last year... The atmosphere, obviously, the team didn't do that well, but I think the atmosphere was really flat at Anfield and there were moments where I think the crowd felt like they didn't have enough to get on top of because they, the energy carries them. They need those moments to spark them. And I do think Klopp's announcement and Klopp's departure, it's given a new energy where they know how much influence they can have and they actually might be able to get them over the line, especially in a time where it's quite difficult with all the injuries. Do you know what, as well, I think when you play at Anfield, certainly against a team of that quality, the last thing you want to do is give them any belief. And I think them getting that penalty straight after half-time, Pep would have probably said, listen, next 10 minutes, keep possession, quiet down the crowd, have a more comfortable second half. When you give them a penalty after, what, five, 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden the crowd go raw because they score it, it was always going to be difficult. But second half, I've never seen a team dominate Manchester City like they did second half. I mean, Diaz, he's probably thinking back today, how have I not scored? at least two of the chances that I got because they were not half chances. These are clear-cut chances. And again, if you're, if you're someone looking at that, that game yesterday, you're thinking, well, do you know what? There is a possibility you can hurt Manchester City because I think too many times, too many teams think they're invincible. They can't beat Manchester City. But when you go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they do leave space. They do leave gaps. You can hurt them. You can exploit the, the spaces that they leave. So I think we learned a lot more about Manchester City than Liverpool, I thought, yesterday. Mm. When Virgil van Dijk was interviewed after the game, he was still in that kind of still in, in match mode, really, still in game mode, and he couldn't quite work out how he felt about the match. He kept saying, it's really good, we've got a draw against Manchester City, we're level on points with Arsenal, but we had those chances in the, in the second half, but then they were on top in the foot, and he couldn't... He kept talking because he couldn't get to the end of his sentence because he couldn't work out what the answer was. Do you think Liverpool should be disappointed that they, they didn't take all three points, given the chances they had in the second half? I think before the game, every player, every manager, you'll take a draw away from home in, in a top game. But then when you see the, the way the game developed and the chances that they had, I think he's probably disappointed. You know, being the club captain, the way that they played with all those young guys, he thought, we probably should have won that game. You know, we were the better side at the end of the game. So I think you're probably content with the point because then you don't lose ground. But obviously, based on the reflection of the game, the way that they played, he probably thought maybe a small miss window, I think, for, for them. And that's probably where you're a little bit caught. After the game, it's the hardest because you, you're literally trying to think, 
Oh, wait, so that, that happened, yeah. that happened, that, <laughs> that happened. That, actually, we, we probably should have won that game, and then you got to deal with the press straight away, so yeah. it is tricky. Do you forget moments in games? Yeah. I, always, I, know, I know some players just say the whole thing went by in a blur. Yeah. But obviously, in that moment, he was, like you say, still piecing it together. So, as a player, is it, is it sometimes delayed when you play it through in your head? Well, I'll tell you who was amazing. Sir Alex was, like, he had, like, a photographic memory. Like, he'd say, like, like that pass in the 24th minute, you're thinking... <laughs> 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 what happened there? So some people do see the game yeah. kind of in pitches like that. I think for us players, when you're still emotionally and physically, you're a little bit tired, you're trying to reflect. And people are asking you about specific moments and you think, I don't want to sound stupid, but I actually yeah, don't, I don't, remember. I don't, I don't <laughs> remember that. I think Lewis Diaz will remember every single one of the oh. opportunities. Oh, yeah. I've been there before. He had so many chances. And the thing is, he had an overall mm. excellent game. He caused all kinds yeah. of problems down the left, but there were a couple of moments particularly when he could have put that game beyond City. And they're the ones he'd be thinking about. Like last night when he's in his bed, he's thinking, oh, have I not scored that one? Because as you said there, he had the one way, put it just wide. The one way he tried to take a touch well, I thought he should have hit it first time. Mm. But other than that, I thought he was outstanding. I mean, he carried the ball. I mean, there was times where he was walker up against him and the centre half would come over, he'd find his way out. But they're the moments, because he's thinking, we've left with a point, but if I'd have done this differently, I'd have done that differently. He's probably still thinking about it now, but I mean, he was outstanding. The, the other thing that, that Liverpool will be thinking about now, and you raised it at the, at the beginning, was the decision towards the end of the, of the game. So this is Jeremy Doku <laughs> on McAllister, on Alexis McAllister, where he goes in to challenge him on the, the edge of the box and catches him in the chest with his foot. So I think sometimes a lot of the discourse around this since the, since the game has been whether or not this was a bookable offence. Is there, is there any question as to whether that's a foul? Do you think? Do you think that's foul? That's <laughs> what I know to take it. Do you know what? I think it. anywhere outside the box, which is going to sound crazy, I think you probably get that foul. So you think it's a foul? Outside the box, but yeah. But you wouldn't give it? But it's I a trap. It. Darren, don't do it. It's a trap. <laughs> trap. In, in that type of scenario, I just I, I can't see how he could give a penalty for that. And, and also, I always like to look at other players' reactions. Yeah. No one really appeals either. And I think McAllister, if he goes with his head then and takes one for the team, I think he probably gets a penalty because it's high foot. Head, but because he turns his back and almost... but it's the same challenge. Yeah, but he tries to initiate the contact by look. Do you watch him here? He doesn't go in bravely, but he turns his back. Well, he's trying to move out of the way of an incoming yes, yeah. He's you pulling know. out of it. Is is? I mean, it's awkward from Doku. It's really awkward. That's mm. what happens when you get attackers defending in your own box. <laughs> One thing I would say is Michael Offer's right there. He's literally a yard behind McAllister. It's if he gives it, they wouldn't overturn it, and because they didn't give it. Um, I, don't, I just don't think they're going to overturn it. I think Klopp had a good point after the game. Anywhere else on the pitch, that's a foul. Mm -hmm. But I think in that moment, they probably didn't want to decide the game with something that was potentially a foul, but not as clear-cut as probably some people made out. So if there's a question mark as to whether it's a, a foul, why not, when there is so much available to the referee in that moment, why not go and look at it? They should on the, on the side of the pitch. You're right. Okay, they should. I think it would. I think the fans and the people in the stadium and club as well just probably make it a little bit easier dealing with that. I, I don't know why they. Don't know why they don't. Yeah, I, I agree with with what all the guys have said. I, I agree with Darren in that. I think in the context of the moment and in the context of him initiating contact with the ball first before he does get contact with McAllister, and also I think the way that the movement on the ball is, he's anticipating that ball to direct come back to him because it bounces and comes towards Doku again. So I do think it's maybe not as dangerous as it looks slowed down than it was in the context that's the question about whether moment. it's a yellow or even... It's not a red card, but even, you know, that, that, the question about how dangerous it is is about whether it's a yellow or a red card. I'm not saying it's a red card. I'm saying that's what that conversation is. That's about the, the danger of the, the, of, the, of the challenge. This should be a question about whether or not it is... A, a legitimate challenge and whether or not it's a, it's a foul. And if you're going to decide a, a game on a penalty decision equally, you're deciding the result of the game by not giving a penalty decision. So either way, you're deciding the outcome of the game, whether you give it or not. I, I think Michael Oliver... If the penalty's scored. I, I generally think he, he probably didn't want to go to the screen. I thought, and as Owen was saying there, that game was, was fantastic and end-to-end -end stuff. And it probably is not the right thing to do, but he probably thought, you know what, rather than going to the screen, if they don't think it's, there's a clear and obvious error there, then I'm not going to the screen. Like, there's, there's no need for me to go to the screen and, and maybe decide the outcome in that manner. So in, in that respect, I can do it. But I can understand both sides. You generally think well, probably it's a foul. I, I, right, I'm not here for my, <laughs> I'm not here for my opinion, but very occasionally, <laughs> you know, it breaks through. But I, but I, I don't understand how kicking someone in the chest isn't a foul. I don't understand it. That's, 
I think, but I think mm. that's a, that seems to me like a reasonable position to take. <laughs> if you kick someone in the chest, it's a foul. Do you know? I do think when you look at a replay, though, and when and these are one of the things I hate. When you slow it down, mm, exactly. it always looks a lot worse than it actually is. Because in real time, as I said, you look at some of the other players, the Liverpool players. I think Quanz is the only one who does that for about half a second, puts his hand down, and Mo Salah is a yard away. He doesn't appeal. I just think in that scenario, full speed. I just don't see how you can give it as a pen. But as I said, anywhere else on the pitch is probably a foul. All, all, we don't want to be talking about VAR after a game that was that entertaining, that was that exciting, that was that was that dramatic. Do you think if it had been given, we'd be sitting here saying, "Oh, they shouldn't have given that. It was a terrible decision." But do you think there would be any debate no, that it I shouldn't have been given? No, I don't. So I don't think there would so, have. No. But if you but if you don't give it, then that's why there there is a a debate because people are saying surely that's a foul. So that means. I think, logically, that it swings more towards it being a foul. But I think also, refs, and they probably won't like me saying this, I think when it gets to that point in the game, in a game that big, I know they're there to decide the game. They don't really want to decide the game with their decision, unless it's 100% clear-cut. So I think in that sense, when, you, when you're watching it, they think... But he has decided. So that's what I mean, which is yeah. interesting, because basically, yeah. by not deciding, yeah. you also are deciding. Yeah. But I do think by that, sometimes I think... I'm not going to give that. Do you know what I mean? Because I think in a game maybe of not the same magnitude, that could have, that probably would have been given potentially. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And so I just think the context of the game and the occasion of it, unless it was a hundred percent clear cut, I think they're going to think, no, nah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to let that. I run. think that has to be taken into consideration what Owen's saying there, because even though it shouldn't happen, it does happen at times because you think as two top teams going for it, top of the table clash, like it's not clear and obvious. Like I wouldn't sit there and go, it's a stonewall penalty. So he's probably thinking. It's probably more is than it isn't. Mm. Yeah, but he's thinking, really, do I want to decide this, yeah. this outcome? Even though I probably should, no, I'll just leave it. If they, if they tell me I've missed something, then I'll go and have a look. If not, we'll just stick to the on-field yeah, decision. But it's one of the sort of unique features of being a referee in football is that you're mm. called on to, to give a subjective opinion and make a subjective... <laughs> no, to make a so subjective right, yeah. decision. It doesn't happen in other sports. It's kind of the rules are, are black and white and you're either inside the rules or outside the rules, whereas there, there's a, there's a sense of intuition that's, that's mm. involved and, and that's where... We end up with with debates. We can't talk about VAR. But do you remember? Day. I'm we, so sick. But remember, of we've had that before, though. Do you remember when the, I can't remember which referee? I say that we've got a referee special coming <laughs> up. You know, it'll be amazing. You'll love it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember who the referee was, but it was the Chelsea Spurs game, the Cucurella hairpull, and he yeah. said that the only reason he didn't send him to the monitor was because a lot had gone on in that game, and he, he felt like it, it would be doing him a, a disservice by yeah. sending him over there, causing more controversy. So I do think it does go on, and, and yeah. it shouldn't happen. But I think sometimes it does. Yeah. Um, from Manchester City's point of view, Kevin De Bruyne came off cool. in the game. Now, there are a lot of City players who are quieter than we would normally expect, particularly in the second half of that one. But Kevin De Bruyne was, was not happy uh, to be taken off in, in this game. But we see this. You know, you see players unhappy to be substituted. Pep Guardiola said he understands that's what he wants to see from a substituted player. It's your kind of standard mm. manager answer. But what I found really interesting were the long conversations that they were having on the bench where Guardiola was over sort of placating Kevin De Bruyne after this decision. Yeah, I mean, in a strange kind of way, I thought it was the right decision. I think, didn't think De Bruyne had his, his best of games, but I think the two, the, the, the two magnitudes of the two players, the manager and, and the, the player, he's probably just saying to him, I'm, I'm unhappy, why have you taken me off? But Pep trying to explain it to him, and I, I think there's something quite nice about that because you don't necessarily see that. Sometimes a top player will go off, nothing's said, and he does what he wants and gets away with it. But I think in this situation, I think he, he was right. I mean, listen, you played the, the position. I just think they, they didn't have control of that second half. Yeah, but there's no way Kev thought he was right. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Even if, he, even if Pep gave him the best argument ever, he was like, I'm still Kevin De Bruyne. Yeah. I'm going to win us the game. I'm going to put it on a plate for Haaland. It was interesting because Pep said it was more about, I think with Kevin, because he's such a brilliant passer, a bit like Stevie G, he's going to try and hit the home run. But sometimes in a game like that, it's a turnover possession and it's a transition and then the Anfield crowd gets up. So he said he wanted somebody that was you know, Kovic is somebody that's going to keep the ball a little bit better. So he probably was right, Pep, but there's no way having that conversation with De Bruyne in that moment, Kevin's going to agree with no. anything that's coming out of and, your mouth. But also, especially because Guardiola played, it feels like a, quite an odd thing to do is to go and, you know, have this conversation, very calming sort of um, position that, that Guardiola, we don't know what he was saying, but he looked very calm when he was talking to, to Kevin De Bruyne. It just, seemed to, it just seemed unusual. I think normally we're just used to managers almost letting the players sulk on the 
on the yeah. bench and leaving it be and picking it up at a later time, rather than seeing live in action in one of the most important games of the season, saying, I'm going to take time to chat through you and explain why. I think that's why it feels so different, because normally there's an awkward handshake and I'll deal with it later. But obviously, because of who he is and how important he is, there needs to be a more of an explanation and a sit down kind of, it's going to be OK, don't worry about it kind of situation, you know? What do you think Pep Guardiola will have made of, of that game? He was, he was a little bit... Not, not argumentative or combative in, in post-match interviews, but he, he seemed irritated, I think. I think, well, first of all, the goal they scored was amazing. Mm. Wow. I mean, every young coach in the world is probably thinking, right, we're going to do that. <laughs> we're going to do that. Every time now. It was amazing, and it looked so easy, yeah. just, just yeah. a little block. So I think in that Johnstone sense... Johnstone said they'd, they'd been working on it the whole of the day before. Well, because he said they saw something on Liverpool, the way they set up, mm. which I'm sure Jurgen Klopp will, will <laughs> tweak. And even, even he said after the game, he said, wow, what a great goal. So I think in that sense, I was surprised the way they started, they didn't go for the jugular a little bit more. Because I thought, even up to that point, Liverpool were pretty good. But actually, they scored, and it felt like... They probably could have kicked on a bit more, but they just tried to keep the ball a little bit. And I think that that was that surprised me. But I think Pep knows going to Anfield, getting a point is a heck of a point because that stadium can 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 hurt every team. Yeah, and particularly the way that they they played in the, in the second half of that game. I just wonder if there are signs there, and we'll talk about the the game to come in a bit more detail. But signs there from that second half performance from City that they can be. Be played against. You can have a, a situation where City, of all teams in the league, are chasing yeah. the ball. Well, I think you've got a belief, and I think Liverpool showed that second half. I think we've seen so many teams go at City and, and not not play that well, more worried about what they can do and, and not really cause them any problems. But teams that have got success against Manchester City are teams that have gone, do you know what? They're probably going to beat us anyway, so why not go out and have a go? Because City can leave gaps. I mean, they overload the midfield. There is space in behind because of the high line. You can get a City in. Of course, Arsenal, will be, who play them next, will be looking at that game. Well, we can exploit it with the pace that they've got. So if Martinelli's back, Saka's back. But you have to believe, first and foremost, in Liverpool's second half, anyone watching that second half would have just thought, wow. Because young players, Luis Diaz, these guys, to create four or five clear-cut chances against Manchester City, that's unheard of. Uh, the surprise probably was Edison making a mistake that he did at, at, kind of, at that time. I think that probably had a big impact on the game. And I think, obviously, his injury as well could have a big impact on the title race. Yeah, and normally he would be out there and, and clearing that ball. That's not, exactly. It's, it's such an un uncharacteristic mistake from him. So Opta have reassessed their chances for everybody winning the Premier League title. Manchester City are still favourites. They've got them at a 45.9% chance. That means that they've gone down by over 5% in terms of their chances of winning. Liverpool more or less the same, but Arsenal are the ones who've benefited from Manchester City dropping points at, at Anfield. And this will be, you'd imagine, well, it is based on the games that they've got, they've got coming up. And maybe Arsenal's chances against Manchester City have changed in the, the sort of aftermath of, of this weekend's uh, performances. Yeah, I mean, still Arsenal have not done very well at the Etihad um, since Arteta took reign over, over Arsenal. But they're gonna, again, they've got to go there and believe. But I mean, Manchester City, I can understand why. I think because of this time, so many times before, we've seen Liverpool Manchester City do so it so at, often. At this stage then... Oh, Manchester, we've seen the, the chances. Do you, do you agree with the percentage chances of Manchester City winning it at this stage? Yes, because Arsenal have got to go to the Etihad. Mm. So I still think that's... If they can overcome that, then it, I think that will change dramatically. But mm. because they've still got to go there and they've never won there, it's still in Manchester City's hands, kind of. So I can understand why the graphic would still show Manchester City as top. Yeah. It's, it's got harder to call, not easier, hasn't it, Owen? <laughs> I was just thinking, let's be honest, nobody has a clue who's going to win. <laughs> All three teams are right in the mixer, uh, and rightly so. Arsenal are more prepared than they have been in the past. So, look, they give themselves a fighting chance now. I think they're a little bit more experienced. Uh, Deccan Rice helps. Hopefully they got them. Injuries is a big one. I mean, all these guys are in Europe as well, so depending on how that plays out. Um, but I think it's going to be fascinating, but I don't think anybody could call it right now. Still, with 10 games to go, we're going to probably the best title race ever, potentially. Let, let's take a look at, at those 10 games, because we've got them for all three of the teams involved. And remember, there's another game um, sort of to, to come that's still to be arranged. So Arsenal have got Chelsea still to be put into the fixture list. Uh, Everton to come for, for Liverpool. So they've got a Merseyside derby on the horizon. And Manchester City are going to be playing Brighton at the, at the Amex. Do, do you think there's anything in that flow in terms of who's got an easier run in, who's got a more difficult run in? Obviously, the, the game between... City and Arsenal is the one that, that stands out. Maybe there's a you know, North London derby in there for Arsenal you want to look at. Manchester United for Arsenal, Manchester United for, for Liverpool. What do you think? 
I think on the balance of that fix fixture list, I think Liverpool have a, a fairly nice run in. I do think that North London derby for Arsenal away at Spurs Stadium, it, it could prove tricky because you know that obviously Tottenham are going to be up for it. They're going to be fighting for Champions League at that point. Arsenal have stumbled sometimes in the last few years there and felt kind of maybe a bit intimidated by the moment and with the way that Ange Postacoglu almost likes his side to rise to that occasion and play with that intensity, it could be a really tough one. So even if they maybe come through that City game fairly unscathed, let's say they get a draw, there's still a lot riding on North London derby away from home. Whereas I look at Liverpool's fixtures and I think, you know, it's yeah, the friendly to, Sunday. Yeah, it's hard to see them tripping up in some of those games because Manchester United just aren't the same beast. But what, what's quite interesting about that is I wonder if it's easier at this stage of the season when players are starting maybe to, to fade or they, they would be starting to fade, if it's easier to have games ahead of you to keep your sharpness, the, the kind of games that make you absolutely focus, or if there's any chance that you could you could slip off in the in the run-in, because not complacency, but maybe just overconfidence, maybe, or relaxing very slightly ahead of a game. Is is that a danger? I think the only thing is pressure. You know, the pressure and Arsenal, obviously they had some injuries last season. They were a young team, probably one of the youngest in the league. They probably struggled with that expectation, I think, at that moment. I think they're more ready. City are definitely ready. Um, and I think Liverpool will be with Jurgen Klopp as well. So I think the only thing is really pressure. And when you get the first crack, because all those teams are going to drop points somewhere, and they probably won't drop them where we think they, they probably should drop them. So um, when you get the first crack, it's when and how you respond. Last season, Arsenal had a little wobble and it turned into a bigger wobble. This season, I think they're more ready. And I think City, with their experience, they'll be the most ready. But whoever has a little crack and how they respond after that moment is going to be the most important thing. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fascinating as it comes to an end. We've still got lots more to talk about, but that is a wrap on Klopp versus Guardiola in the Premier League. That's it. Klopp as Liverpool manager, Guardiola as Manchester City manager. Certainly, that's the, the last time that's going to happen. It's, it's, um, it's been quite a ride. It's been fantastic. I mean, two of the, the, the greatest rivalries we've ever seen, certainly in the discussion. But both, what I like about it, there was no cheap talk between the two either. Quite utmost respect for both. Both have got top teams. Going to miss it. Yeah, it's been, it's been a great rivalry. Yeah, well, I mean, they had the same one in, in, you know, in Germany. And I think that the respect they have for each other, the fact that they actually play different, but they're still equally almost as successful. Uh, I'm sure they're friends off the pitch, and I'm sure they'd probably just love to get together and just have a drink and talk about all the different teams they've managed. But they've been two absolute giants of the game. And that game on the weekend was, I know we're talking about the referees, but Klopp, Pep and their teams have been absolutely a pleasure to watch. Yeah, absolutely. A pleasure to watch and a pleasure to report on, Flo. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I'm going to miss the characters more than anything, actually. Obviously, Pep's probably going to stay at Manchester City for a little bit longer. But I do think it's not only how good their teams are and their success, obviously, but two amazing characters, really interesting personalities, funny, a little bit intimidating at times, a little bit, you know, they keep you on your toes. And I do think the league will certainly miss having Klopp around because he has created so much narrative and gives you so much to talk about all the time. He already has one trophy this season, but it is the League Cup and he would like something maybe a little bit more glamorous to end the season. But there are three teams going for this Premier League title. We have touched on Arsenal, but we'll look at them in a bit more depth next after Mikel Arteta celebrated another three points for the Gunners. Clicked in for Hammond! Emirates euphoria. Ramsdale really. Kai Havertz did it at Brentford. And now he scores what's going to be a late winner against the same opposition here in North London. Fist bumps from Mikel Arteta. Arsenal are top of the league. That goal difference, which is seven better than Liverpool in a title race this close, could prove crucial come the end of the season. Every advantage you can get in this title race might well help. And Kai Havertz is in the form of his, a form of his career, well, certainly in the form of his career in England. Yeah, and again, 
a lot of credit goes to Mikel Arteta. A lot of people question the decision to sign him for, for such big money. Um, but he's, he's coming good. I mean, he, you see he's a good football player. It was where you play him. I quite like him when he plays false nine. Um, I think at the minute I'd rather have him than Gabriel Jesus down the middle. But you always know what you're going to get from him. He's always there or thereabouts. He's, he's better in the end than people give him credit for. And even if he doesn't score, he usually gets the first credit. He's always there or thereabouts. But fair play to him. Took a lot of criticism over the years, but he is um, he's starting to come good. And again, good player that can play a number of positions. Yeah, he's always been better than maybe his reputation from his time at Chelsea suggests. Are we starting to see that now at Arsenal? Yeah, I mean, I think he's a super player. Always have. And I think when you, if your job is to watch football players and critique them and you watch him and don't see a good football player, then I worry for you. Because the, the only problem with him is he doesn't have a set position. And that's his only downfall. You think about Udegaard and, and Saka and Martina, they all have their fixed positions. The problem is with Kai, he's so versatile and he can play so many positions that he gets kind of drifted everywhere, and it's to his own detriment. But I just think he's physically... Played, he's played full-back before in his career as well. <laughs> in it? the last international for Germany, he played, he played wing-back and left-back. Right, OK. <laughs> but the point is, yeah. he's probably a number 10, but Udegaard plays a... He, he, he was, for Leverkusen, he was best off the right, but obviously they have Saka there. And I think, so in a way, they signed a player that can play four or five positions, but they needed somebody with the money they spent to score goals. And I think right now, false nine, getting in the box... He's brilliant in the air because of his size. I, I just think he's been an amazing addition. Credit Edu and Mikel for, for signing such a, a unique player. Yeah, and, and this has been a sort of hallmark of, of Arsenal and under Mikel Arteta, is finding the right position for, for players and working with them to make sure that they're as effective as they can be there. Yeah, and I, I think to what Owen said, I, I think it has been difficult for him because I still feel like he's a player that needs a couple of chances in a game because even before he got that header on Saturday, he missed a huge chance mm. a few minutes earlier that he thought had gone in but actually ended up missing the angle by like a, quite a big margin. So I do think it's in those moments where we're seeing it pay off for him, you still think... He's getting quite a few chances. It's almost like, how can you then take that next next step to be even more consistent? And I think that's maybe the final piece of the puzzle for him. But it's not really a surprise when he has not only been moved around uh, positionally, but also, you know, the end of his Chelsea career was, you know, quite stop-start. He's been in and out of starting lineups and everything. So I do think it does take time to then build up that form again to be as consistent as you need to be. And like Owen said, if you've been bought as a goal scorer and you, you're not in form over the last couple of years, then it's hard to find that again. But what Arsenal do know is that he scored in the Champions League final. So he can handle that pressure. And I think that's what gave him all that respect and credit in the bank at Chelsea. So it feels like there's still so much more to come from him. Do you know what he does as well? He does a lot of the, the, the ugly stuff well. And when I say that, you look at the amount of headers he wins, he challenges, he picks up second ball. Do you know what I mean, he does... The Odegaard doesn't really want to do it. He's a more of a silky footballer. You've got Declan Rice, who's, who's doing that eight job really, really well. But... He just picks up pieces, he challenges the centre-half, he's a real focal point. He's not the quickest, but he seems to be able to glide away from players as well. And I think the more he plays in that system, certainly as a false nine, I think the better he'll become. And it, it so happens that he's got a regular run in the team now, and that's why the, the goals are coming. I mean, when you, you're in and out of a team, you're never going to see the best of anybody. But now he's getting a consistent run in Arsenal's team, you're starting to see him at his best. I think people confuse his body language with being quite chilled and relaxed, with, you know, kind of not being not being as competitive. If you look at his career pathway, leaving Leverkusen to go to Chelsea, that's a big move for a young kid in lockdown. He could have gone to Bayern and had it easy. Went to Chelsea, it was tough, and Chelsea turned out to be a bit of a mess. Uh, I think he was their top scorer, wasn't he? Last mm -hmm. season, even though he's not a centre for him. And then he makes an even tougher move, I think, to go across to Arsenal. That tells you all you need to know, I think, about him. Forget his body language. He makes big decisions for a young kid, and I think that is... That is, you know, brave decisions, which I think are quite rare for somebody at that age. Yeah, question of body, uh, body, la body language. It's easier to say it than show it, maybe. <laughs> um, but in, in terms of body, body language, I think it's a really interesting one because I think so many players are criticised for having poor body language. I wonder if it's a product of that sort of intense pressing that has come in and out of, of fashion in, in football. And if that sort of, that's seen as being a player who's got good body language, if you're constantly running and constantly on the go, and maybe a player who thinks a bit more is seen as being a bit more laid back and maybe not caring as much at times. But I think Uzel had that body language which you either loved or you hated. Mm -hmm. And I think the modern coach probably didn't love it because it didn't look like he was running as much. I think if you look at the stats for Kai, He's always running, you know, whether he's always tacking. Benty makes a great point about winning second balls. I think people criticise him maybe the way he looks or lots of different things. But actually, if you look at the way Kai plays and his numbers, 
you know, there's, you know, there's, there's nothing timid, timid about him. Yeah. I think the decision making has been another, you know, thing that he's had to learn as he's got more experience and got older. And I think when he first started playing for Arsenal this season, fans were a little bit frustrated about some of the decisions he was making in games and the opportunities he was missing as a result of that. And I do think part of that's being in a new team, understanding your teammates, understanding what they want from you. It's not been easy with the fact that Jesus hasn't really been around. So how do you build relationships with players? And the pressure is there. But I think the fact that Arsenal need him in this run-in, which is a point in the season that they struggled last year, that's also an opportunity that he can then grab and, and really establish himself as do a key part. Do you know what as well? It's about being in a stable environment. Chelsea, as you said there, I mean, it was a bit of a mess. I know it was it was good at first, Thomas Tuchel came in, but towards the end it was a, a mess. You didn't know who was in charge, what was going on. He's gone to Arsenal, which is stable. Mikel Arteta looks like he's going to be there for a long time. He probably feels more relaxed in himself. He probably feels more settled. And now he's starting to play with teammates that trust him as well. Because at Chelsea, you just didn't know... I just felt like he was getting criticised a lot for... Maybe not even necessarily his own fault, but now at Arsenal, everyone seems to be buying into it. He's taking a bit of time to win the fans over, but now you can quite clearly see. You put him in a stable environment, he's a top, top player. Should he have been on the pitch? Yes. I know, I know we don't want to <laughs> We're going to go back. Yeah. We've got more VAR chat. Um, did he dive? Yes. So is it a yellow? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So should he have in, been on the, the pitch? In the moment, in the moment. But obviously we know with that retrospectively, with VAR, you can't go back and do that. But if it had been seen in the moment, yes. Yes. Did he dive? Uh, listen, he's probably gone down a bit. <laughs> he's probably gone down a bit easier. But my problem with that is, right, there is a bit of contact there. So that, that, that you can't tip is not contact. Really? Before, before or or after minimal. He died. Yeah, minimal, but it's contact. Really? Before, before or after he died? No, he died. <laughs> <laughs> he died. It should have been a yellow card. He actually, 100%. but I think he actually dies before the contact. Yeah. Mm. There probably is a, a fraction of it. Um, but I do think he probably goes a little bit early because sometimes I think as a player you're anticipating Exactly, it. I was going to say it's yeah. the anticipation that gets him. And I mean, that is like <laughs> hip on him. <laughs> that is just like... What we should say from a referee's point of view is that I think in terms of VAR going to look at it, they can only look at penalty decisions, goal decisions, red card decisions, so they can't go back and look at a potential dive. If they had given the penalty, I think I'm right in saying they could go back say it's not a penalty, reverse that original and then, decision and then give a yellow off the back of it. But they can't go and look at it just, just for a as a dive. Card, so yeah. because the penalty wasn't given, they can't go and, and say they, they've just said not enough contact for a penalty and, mm. and so it's, it's, not, it's not been given. And that's why that happened and that's why he was on the pitch to I was to surprised, if I'm honest. When, when it went to VAR, I did think, oh, he could go here. Because, as you said, there, it is a dive. Even though there's minimal contact, which there is, he probably should have gone for that. Yeah. Um, Aaron Ramsdale, it's not been the easiest of seasons for him by any stretch of the imagination. David Raya has come in ostensibly as a joint number yeah. one goalkeeper, which clearly has is, is not been the case for him. And Aaron Ramsdale has to come, uh, come, on, uh, come on and deputise for him because Raya can't play against his parent mm -hmm. club, Brentford, from whom he's on loan. And it's all going all right for Aaron Ramsdale. Yeah. You know, dis in terms of distribution, a couple of long throws, a couple of steady saves... All absolutely fine, but then it, it all sort of falls apart from him. This is all relatively comfortable so far, and, he, and he's even starting up a couple of a couple of attacks. Yeah, I mean, again, listen, Art, what Arteta's done at Arsenal has been has been superb, and there's not too many things you can criticise him for. This is probably one instance I'd probably go he's caused this problem because he, he's, he's brought in David Ray, who has been fantastic. You, you can't hide the fact, but he's just made at one stage both goalkeepers very nervous, and, and Aaron Ramsdale is suffering from that badly at the minute. And right before half-time, this happens. Mm. Oh, so unlucky. Yeah. Nobody wants... Uh, you just feel for Ramza because he was so brilliant last year. The one thing you would say is... Mikel's job is... Well, that, I mean, that was some strike from, from Sonny, by the way. Yeah. It was even better from behind. But the one thing you would say is Mikel's job is to get the, make Arsenal the best team. They're better this year. Mm. Not just because of Raya, and Aaron Ramza is a, is a brilliant goalkeeper. From where Mikel wants to go, he wants the goalkeeper to play a certain way like David Raya, be a little bit better with his feet. Um, and you'd have to say that the proof is, after 30 games, or 28 games, Arsenal are a slightly better side, mm -hmm. concede less goals. I think they've the best they defence can, in the Premier League. They concede less goals, but I think David Raya's save percentage is not 
brilliant. I think it might be one of the worst in the in the league. It's just that he doesn't face yeah. a lot of shots because the defensive unit works works really well together. But Aaron Ramsdale re recovering from from that mistake to pull off a couple of very good. I don't know if we're maybe overstating a couple of those saves because everybody wants Aaron Ramsdale to do well. He's that type of character. But there was so much support for him on on Instagram, and and you saw the reaction from from the players and the backroom staff as he made his way off the pitch at half time. Yeah. Do you know what I think? Aaron Ramsdale will come out of this really well. He'll, he'll probably end up leaving Arsenal in the summer and go be a regular somewhere else. And that, that's all football is, you know, sometimes. Some people are better fit for certain places. He did a great job for Arsenal last season. Manager decided in a different way this season. And I'm sure if I was Aaron, I'd probably be thinking, right, I'm going to potentially go play. I don't want to sit on the bench at, at such a peak time in my career. But he's a brilliant goalkeeper. David, right, it's just a little bit different, maybe a little bit better with his feet. Um, but I, I, I'm sure Ramsdale's going to get a big job in the summer yeah. if he fancies it. I just wonder, from a, from a player's perspective, if you think that the fact that Ramsdale made that mistake was caused in any way by the fact that he's not match fit, that he hasn't been playing games, that maybe there just wasn't quite that either speed of thought or speed with his getting his feet sorted out, or if it maybe just was a little bit of of rustiness. Is that is that a, a reason that it might have happened? Do you think? Yeah, a little bit of rust, but also as well ultra safe because he's thinking to himself, I don't want to give the ball away, I don't want to be the reason that Arsenal concede a goal or we don't win the game. And as players, you go through that, don't you? When, you, when you're, you're, you're not necessarily the first choice, but you've been put in because someone's injured, you're like, I don't want to let the team down. So maybe he's overthinking everything every time he takes a touch, because I'm sure last season it would go there and away it would go, but he's thinking, right, taking maybe a, a split second more than he should do just to yeah. get it right, and then he gets caught. And unfortunately, this is the position that he's in, but listen, he's, he's going to learn from that. I agree with what Owen said there. He probably won't be at Arsenal next season because I think he's too good of a goalkeeper to sit on somebody's bench and... And they'll be able to sign Raya rather than have him in on the Exactly. And, and there's, loads of, there's loads of clubs out there where they've got their number ones, but I think he's better. So I don't think he's going to have a problem as to where he goes. And I do think people forget that Raya's had some moments like that too yeah. where he's left it late or got himself into trouble with situations because the way that Arsenal play, they want the goalkeeper to be part of that distribution with their feet. And... Ramsdale is very good with his throws. He's very also good with long kicks. And the reason that Ryan needs to come in is because he was struggling at corners. He was struggling with aerial balls, and they made that impact. But I, also, I don't think Ryan's looked super consistent and comfortable. So I almost think it's the same issues almost disrupting both of them. But I think when you look at what happens when you change a goalkeeper, which Arteta, I think, felt like he could maybe cheat the system and say, we'll play two of them, is that you do disrupt that, that unit. And I think when Ramsdale's coming in, cold, not just from a match fit point of view, but just building those relationships. I think all the defence have to make an adjustment as a result. But I also don't think Raya has been, you know, 100% comfortable either way. He will be back, of course, for the game against Manchester City. I can't wait for that one. 31st of March for Manchester City against Arsenal. Mm. How, are you nervous yet already? No, do you know what? I'm not. And I think that second half Are you confident? No, I'm not confident. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, he was nervous. David Raya played nervous at the... The fixture the, the, at the Emirates. Yeah, he made the, the crowd. Emirates. I was there. He made the crowd nervous. Yeah. Um, so I think Phil makes a good point. Mm -hmm. But I think he's in a better place now, David Ryan. I think the team's in a better place. Declan's had a big impact. Kai has had a big impact. So I'm curious. So I mean, Arsenal that are in a better place than they were when they beat Manchester City at the Emirates earlier in the season. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I think I think actually Arsenal Arsenal were good in that game. They got an important result, but. I don't think they were that good. I no, think it was more City being really poor. Yeah. I think the definitive moment for me was Arsenal being Liverpool at the Emirates. That's when you see, OK, they have outclassed a phenomenal side and I think we're going to see a different situation because of that. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I was so sure what yeah. I was saying there. Yeah. <laughs> but no, yes. You were not, you were watching yeah. the goals. It's going to be a completely different game, but we, we expect at the Emirates. But Arsenal, I think, as you said, that, that period of the season, even though Arsenal were getting results, they weren't necessarily playing as well as they're playing now. So I think Declan Rice has, has come on leaps and bounds. All, Jorginho has been put back yeah. into a situation where I thought at one stage, maybe his time has come to an end. He's starting to control games. You've got Thomas Partey coming back. I think Arsenal right now are in a really good place. I was going to ask if you think it's a title decider, but I think we might be going back to that old cliche of, well, it can't be won there, but it can be lost. <laughs> Uh, yeah, do you know what? <laughs> it's, uh, I'll just, I'll just talk to you know, myself. You know, I think it's one of those where, you're right, I still think with Manchester City, and I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's because of what we've seen previous, that even if they do lose a game, I still expect them to, to go on and win 90% of the games that they've got left. So looking at the last 10 fixtures which we saw earlier, I think Arsenal are going to have to win minimum seven.
to, to win the title because I just can't see the other two dropping that many points at and, all. And there's too many games left. Still. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It was too early to call. We're not we're not doing predictions just yet, <laughs> but we're just, just predicting it's going to be a good end to the season for Manchester City, for Liverpool and for Arsenal. But it's going to be a really exciting end to the season in terms of the race for the top four as well. Because Tottenham's win, Manchester United's win, and of course the defeat for Aston Villa means that it's all getting very close. But who'll be playing Champions League football come the end of the season. Betako taking it on, finding Song. Assisting away from Cash, it's Werner, and it's four. Two great goals at the start of the second half. Tottenham are running riot. Goals in two Premier League games with Timo Werner. What a win that was for Tottenham, particularly because Manchester United had won by two goals to nil against Everton. It means that Tottenham keep the gap between themselves and Man United to six points. But it also means that because they beat Villa, the gap between them is now two points and Tottenham have a game in hand both on Manchester United and it's looking more significantly. They have a game in hand over Aston Villa above them. So as your two former teams... It's, that's another one that's that's looking harder to call. Do you think Tottenham might just shade it come the end of the season? Yeah, I do. I just think the the aspect of Europe for Aston Villa as well, having to kind of concentrate on, on both might cause them an issue where Spurs have got that straight run at finishing the top four. But that was a real statement from Spurs yesterday. I know some of the surroundings conceding the two goals in quite quick succession, then getting the red card completely changed the game. But I just feel that they're in a, a better place, Spurs, right now to, to get that top four. And, and as I said, Una Emery who is a master in Europe, he's, he's got both to deal with and they've got injuries to deal with as well. I just feel that they'll share. I think Villa are finishing the top five for sure. I don't think Manchester United will catch either, but I think Spurs for that fourth spot will we'll just shade it. Do you know, I, I asked a, a friend of mine who supports Spurs, I was like, it's been, the form's been patchy. I've not seen like full 90 minutes of, of mm. many Spurs games recently, maybe the odd one. I was like, why is it kind of fallen away a bit? Why are the results not being there? And I was like, oh... Just, you know, just not that good at the moment. And, a few, then, <laughs> and then that result comes against Aston Villa, in which they just absolutely blew them away, particularly in the second half, I think, of, of that game. Yeah, I mean, to go and do that at Villa Park mm. is... I mean, their home form at the beginning of the season, I think, was the best in the league after 10 games. So I thought that was... I thought it was a statement performance, really. To go there against such a brilliant coach in Emery and dominate the game, I thought, was, was top draw. Even before the, the red card, they were by far the better team. Madison with, I mean, Saar with a brilliant cross and a great goal for Madison. But I just thought that team, I think they had about 70% possession, Tottenham. They were so good and Ange would be so proud to go there and that, on that stage and win such a big game. Yeah, I think Tottenham's away record hasn't been great this season. I think what the game on Sunday proved is how they can win being patient. Because I think too often with Ange Postoglu's style of play, it relies on that high intensity, playing in transition, you know, relying on trying to break teams. And I do think yesterday they, they got a lot more of the ball and I think they need to get better at working away and being patient and grinding out games. And I think that's why this was such an important result against a European, you know, race for Champions League rival is that, that gives them something to build on. They've also got key players coming back now, which is the opposite of Aston Villa's situation. So I do think it felt like a statement one. And even, yeah, even before John McGinn's weird moment, they, they were 2 all up and looked to be cruising anyway. Do you know what? I think the Van der Ven injury, though, is a big one because he's that pace that he's got, we saw it yesterday. I mean, there was times where Aston Villa were getting him behind and he was he was clawing it back and Ollie Watkins is quick. The fact they've lost him now to another hamstring injury, you just hope it's not bad because he has been absolutely outstanding since he got to Tottenham. Yeah, hopefully they've just been a bit cautious around mm. that and, and making sure that they can, they can nurse him back to, to full health. So three teams in the battle for one, maybe two places in the Champions League next season. Let's take a look at what they've got coming up. Just to remind you, Tottenham do have Fulham at the weekend, but it's a shorter um, bunch of Premier League fixtures because it's also FA Cup quarter-final weekend. So Villa and Man United not in action. Um, so that's the, the final 10 Premier League fixtures that these two teams have. So this is basically from after the international break, from that last weekend in March onwards. And there's some really difficult games in there for both sets of, of players. It's, it's not... This is not cut and dried. It's, again, it's another one that's really difficult to predict. And, and teams like Aston Villa and, and Tottenham in particular could end up being kingmakers with Manchester City and Arsenal and Liverpool to, to come for all of them. 
Yeah, the team, I just don't think Manchester United will catch either of those two, thing, two teams. I know that they're still part of the conversation, but I just think on the balance of their entire season, how inconsistent they are, the issues that still remain, I don't think they've got enough to chase it. It's, it, it's good that they've managed to get themselves to this point and still be in the conversation, but I just don't see them catching Spurs or Villa. It wasn't a convincing performance. It was two penalties for the win against Everton, was it? Kelly, you're being very kind. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, it was mad. Actually, Everton, I think, had as much of the ball as, mm -hmm. as Manchester United at Old Trafford. They were pretty average. You know, two penalties obviously changed the game. You know, Flo mentioned they're not playing great United, but the fact that they're even in that conversation is crazy, mm -hmm. the way they've played all season. We saw the goal difference there. I think the others were plus 20. United is on zero. Yeah. You know, so which is the worst that, that they've ever been at this point mm -hmm. since, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, which just shows, I think, how low they've even managed to fall this but season. It'd be, I mean, to be fair, they're there. You know, they, if they go on a mini run, they could do it. I, 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 the way they played in their body of work, I'd say no. Um, they've got some tough fixtures as well, yeah. but... You know, if, if they get Shaw, you know, and Martinez back, you know, I think they could, they could go on a mini run, but they just, they're so inconsistent, it's mm. crazy. I think the only bright spot has been the young guys, Garnacho, Hoyland, Kobe Maynard, they've been, they've been fantastic, but the rest of the season has is, is been a mess, really. Yeah, it feels very much like Manchester United at a stage of the season where they're, they're building for the, for the future. This mm. is about kind of assessing where, where they are. I mean, it'd be nice to be in Champions League football next season, certainly for any, any new manager that wanted to come in and and get money if they make a managerial change. I'm not announcing that live on air, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> if. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is about, if they can somehow finish in the top four, it'll be a great season for them. But as the guys were saying there, it's not been great at all this season. I'm not quite sure what team they're trying to be. In possession, out of possession. Do they want to be a counter-attacking team? I mean, you'd never ever used to see teams go to Old Trafford and dominate possession. Certainly not a side like Everton, who they'd usually finish them off. So I think it's going to be a big end to the season for Manchester United and a big one for Eric Ten Hag because... I think, regardless what happens to them, I don't think it'll be there next season anyway. Busy midweek of fixtures as well coming up for the Premier League sides. Not necessarily all in, in Premier League action, but there is a game between Chelsea and Newcastle this evening. On Tuesday, big match for Arsenal. They trail Porter by a goal to nil from the first leg of their Champions League last 16 tie. Can they overturn that? We'll find out on Tuesday. Bournemouth taking on Luton in the Premier League on Wednesday night. That should even things up in terms of games played at the bottom of the table. And then on Thursday, it's Europa League action uh, with West. West Ham against Freiburg, Brighton up against Roma and Liverpool taking on Sparta, Sparta Prague and then Aston Villa in their Europa... What's it? Europa Conference League. Yeah. I keep getting the name of that one. I keep getting saying Champions Conference League. Europa Unai's Conference probably won it anyway, whatever. Yeah, whatever it is, Unai Emery's got it. Got the mark of that. So Aston Villa taking on Ajax in, in that one. So big week of fixtures. And then, as I say, next weekend in the, in the Premier League is going to be a much quieter weekend because lots of the teams that we've been talking about are also in FA Cup action. and they've reached the quarter-final stage. So you'd expect that they're going to be naming pretty strong teams. And with... Those games coming in the run into the end of the season, it's going to be really interesting to see what the team selection is for that one. But lots of teams fighting on all different fronts. We've still got to get a bottom-of-the-table clash to be decided. We need to work out who's going to be yeah. involved in that relegation battle come the end of the season, although a couple of them we think we might know already. Still got to work out who's going to be playing Champions League football come the end of the season. And we've still got to work out who's going to be going for that Premier League title. It's as close as it's been in years. We'll be back next week to talk about it all. For now, though, from all of us, bye-bye.